In 1889, Copper King W.A. Clark and 74 other men wrote a state constitution to serve the needs of Montana's powerful interests with a weak governor, a secretive legislature, and special tax deals for the powerful. After 60 years under the copper collar, Montana was declared the nearest thing to a colony of any American state. The Anaconda Mining Company even owned most Montana newspapers, the Copper Press. The corporate dominance of Montana's political affairs was unique in American history. Seventy years after statehood, the Copper Press was finally sold and thousands of World War II veterans had been educated under the GI Bill. Newly enlightened Montanans wanted out from under the copper collar, and big winds of change roared across the treasure state. Changing Montana's constitution was the top priority. Strengthening the governorship, opening up the legislature, empowering citizens. Voices of Montana women, totally silenced in 1889, rang out loud and clear for these changes. When the Constitutional Convention began, 19 women were among the elected delegates. And when the delegates came together in convention, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, men and women, young and old, sat alphabetically as equals, Montanans just wanting to make their state better. And so they did, producing a Constitution for the ages, the last best constitution. Now at its 50th anniversary, Evan Barrett and real history makers of the time shine a light on the creation of this remarkable Montana constitution. Uh, welcome to Last Best Constitution. Uh, this series of episodes about the Montana constitution created in 1972 is occasioned upon the 50th anniversary of that constitutional convention. It occurred in uh, the early months of 1972, and the, the product, the Constitution of Montana, was ratified by the voters in June of 1972. So here in June of uh, 19, uh, 2022, 50 years later, we gathered together in the state capitol, in the House of Representatives, uh, which they, the delegates called Convention Hall. And that was a place where 100 delegates got together, uh, citizen delegates. Uh, none of them could be elected officials. They couldn't be a legislator. They couldn't be a mayor. They couldn't be elected official at the time. And so it, they were citizen delegates and they met as a group. There were 58 Democrats, there were 36 Republicans, there were five independents. Uh, of those 100, uh, they sat alphabetically so as not to create artificial divisions between the parties. They tried to operate in a uh, bipartisan or nonpartisan manner, uh, sharing the power in the, in the committees, uh, sitting together, uh, working as citizens, saying we want to do something that's right for our state. Uh, the emergence of the Constitutional Convention came out of the uh, 1889 Constitution, uh, which was drafted by uh, a group of all men delegates, because women weren't even allowed to vote then, let alone be delegates to a convention. And those uh, 75 men uh, wrote a document, and that document was written by the powerful uh, for the powerful. The chairman of the convention was W.A. Clark, the most nefarious of the Butte Copper Kings. And he, what year was that? Uh, that was uh, 1889. Uh, uh, we have a special, we have a, we're doing a special thing today, by the way. As you can see this laptop computer in front of me, we're doing a Zoom interview uh, with uh, a special person who I'll introduce in just a minute. But we'll, uh, let me just say that the powerful interest uh, wrote things in their interest uh, in that old constitution. And the net effect of this uh, enlightened constitution that came about in 1972 after a period of activism uh, it was the advancement of the environmental movement, the women's movement, the Native American movement. There were a lot of different movements going on in America at the time. Uh, young people were getting the right to vote, a lot of activism. And in Montana, 
men came home from World War II and women too and took advantage of the GI Bill and became educated. So uh, we had a lot of things going on, a lot of uh, uh, dynamic factors uh, going on in Montana that uh, culminated in a constitution. One of the steps in that process was the step of having a constitutional revision commission. And today, uh, we have a special guest with us, uh, the last remaining member, actually, of the Constitutional Revision Commission, uh, Harry Mitchell of Great Falls. Uh, Harry was a state senator at the time, later was a county commissioner in Cascade County as well, but at the time was a, a, a state senator, and along with a number of other state senators, state house members, representatives appointed by the Supreme Court uh, and some appointed by the governor to come up with this revision commission. And we are honored, I must say, honored to be able to uh, talk about that commission and the whole constitutional process uh, with Harry Mitchell. Harry, I'm turning to you. Welcome on board Last Best Constitution. Well, thank you very, very much. But uh, I must admit I'm a bit uh, uh, confused as to what I'm going to be able to do and add, add to this. Uh, this. I'm leaving that up to you to, to guide me. Well, we'll get we'll work our way through it. We'll have a conversation. We'll have to pretend like I'm up there with you, and we're just having a chat, uh, and we're remembering what happened back in the 19. Uh, late 1960s, uh, you were a state senator from Great Falls. Do you? Uh, how many terms did you serve in the in the state senate? Uh, three. Three uh, sessions or three terms? Three uh, terms. So that's 12 years. Okay. Oh no 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 no! It would be uh, here. You go checking my memory, and it's. Uh, I think I was born with Alzheimer's, but anyway, uh, it was 69. 67, 69, and 70. Okay, okay. So uh, uh, so you were representing Great Falls. Uh, yeah. uh, you were on the, at that time, the elections were uh, at large throughout the entire county, right? So you ran in a, in yes, a group. In fact, in fact, we had to uh, draw straws uh, to see who got a two-year term and who got a four-year term. Mm -hmm. first go around and it was interesting and that was because of the as i remember was because of the reapportionment that had taken place it was uh, the the uh, the federal uh, the supreme court came out and said one man one vote and because right. of that we had this really terrible thing in montana it seemed to mirror the federal we had one senator per county and yeah. uh, and so petroleum county had 800 people in it and it was right next to Yellowstone County, which had 80,000 people. The difference of 100 to 1, and they both had one senator uh, in the old, uh, and so they said, well, that's unconstitutional. We've got to do one person, one vote. So out of that, they elected groups of them. So you were elected, and, and, and again, my memory was that the legislature did a reapportionment of that, and the courts threw it out and said they, they didn't do it right and the federal court drew the lines. And so it was under that that you were one of those that came in and you draw. So you got a four year, or you got a two year. I got a two year. You got a two and then you got reelected and you got another four. Correct. Okay, so that gave you 69, 67, 69, and 71. Uh, and then, under, the, under the old constitution, yes. Yeah, yeah. And so that allowed you to be there and on both sides of the constitutional convention beforehand and and then during the convention it's well right after the convention itself now that you were in that session let's uh, let's uh, uh, were you on the legislative council no okay so you were appointed uh, in 19 uh, in 1969 when you were first in there uh, the legislative council had the previous cycle done a study of the legislature of the uh, Constitution and they found a, in that study, uh, which then your commission then 
completed the study was how much of the Constitution could be saved, the old Constitution, the 1889 Constitution, how much could be saved and how much could be, uh, had to be thrown out. And basically about half of it had to be thrown out. Uh, so they formed a revision commission uh, uh, and you were appointed as one of the senators. Uh, I'm going to mention some names here. I'm going to pull it up here so I, uh, I have it on my, my phone here. The chairman of that Montana Constitutional Revision Commission was, uh, was uh, Jack McDonald from up in Great Falls. Correct. And uh, the vice chairman was in the House side was Jim Murphy from Kalispell. Yep. Yeah, so you remember that. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and then the other, ho uh, the other legislators uh, were you and, uh, and John Lyon on the Senate side. Yeah, uh, John was from Shelby, as I remember. Yes. Uh, so you guys were senators, and and so you, now I want to have, have you got a have you got that list there in front of you? Yes, right here. Well, take a look at that list because I'd like to have these are the people who who took on the job of researching the changes in the Constitution that needed to be done under under your guidance. So you had researchers working with you, young researchers. Uh, but there was you and, and uh, McDonald and Murphy and uh, John Lyon and Bill Spear and Bob Watt. Uh, Jim Moore was another senator uh, yep. and uh, Bob White. And then they added some from the Supreme Court. Supreme Court appointed Wade DeHood and I think they appointed Marjorie Brown uh, and then the, uh, the governor appointed some, and that's where uh, Dick Rader got, was there and Leonard Schultz. Uh, oh, Kendrick Smith was appointed by the courts as well. He was a, a major attorney. So you had lawyers, you had uh, legislators, and you had governor appointments. That was your group. Uh, do you remember those sessions? Uh, 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 does any of that come to mind right now? Uh, <laughs> Ah, you think not, huh? <laughs> no, I can't remember. Okay. Italy about okay. Those, that was 50 years ago. How about the people? Now, take a look at that list. Do any of those jump out to you? And you have him, yeah, I'm Give me your recollections of those people. Because you were the well, founding fathers in a way. You're, you're, you're asking me to remember something that... Well, just anything that you remember about about any of those people. What did you remember about working with uh, with uh, Jack McDonald or working with John Lyon? Uh, well, at that time, it, it's interesting with Jack McDonald. He was a Democrat at that time, and what year did he switch order to become? A oh, Republican? it was quite a few years later, actually. Yeah, half a year, half a decade later, anyway. Yeah. Right. And, uh, no, those, I, I remember the names, but I, I couldn't place the, the people today. You, you, okay. You're talking about hard. okay, okay. Well, they ended up doing the research on this thing, Harry, and 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 uh, uh, you recall that uh, uh, there was a lot of talk about changing the governorship and making it stronger uh, because the governorship was kind of weak at that time. Forrest Anderson. Forrest came in right, right then, yeah, in six, right. in '68, and he wanted to have a stronger governorship, and ba right. and basically, uh, uh, they, uh, the, the a lot of departments were run by boards instead of by department directors. And the governor had to appoint boards. It took him five years to appoint the boards. So the boards ran everything and not the governor. So they wanted to have a strong governor. Uh, uh, the legislature was kind of secretive. Do you remember at first how you didn't, they didn't take, they didn't take, record your votes? Oh, yeah. yeah. It was, it was a, a very interesting time period. It was interesting because of the uh, environmental movement, the civil rights movement, and uh, women's rights, you name it, there was a very progressive time period. That, uh, the 
the uh, new constitution just put icing on a cake of a, a time period that was long overdue and really uh, welcomed by many people, most people in Montana, but not all. There was, there was a controversy on that. You know about, about that better than I do, Kevin. Well, you know, when you first put it up to a vote, uh, the, the legislature, your 1969 legislature, you voted to put on the ballot the question, shall we have a constitutional convention? So you voted to put that out there. And at that time, 65% of the voters said yes. Yep. So there was a high degree of interest in it. Uh, see, people tell me it had a lot to do with the legislature too, though, because it was fairly opaque. It was, it was kind of... Uh, secretive legislature. You didn't know what was going on in the committees. and uh, That's right. That's absolutely correct. And uh, people were eager to know more and understand more. Uh, uh, chairman would uh, call an executive session, kick everybody out the door. <laughs> you you're taking me back a long ways, but okay. keep going. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, that's that's what I'm told by all those that were there, uh, uh, that it was fairly secretive. And, and when you guys went on to second reading, uh, you uh, debated everything and you carried, you had the votes, but they didn't record the vote. They just counted right. the numbers and then they turned the lights off and, and the vote disappeared. So uh, people could not tell how their legislators voted. Well, that's absolutely true. And uh, it, it was terrible. And that's one reason that uh, we're so happy with our current constitution. And one reason we're a little bit, uh, at least I'm a little bit concerned about uh, some of the folks in the government today that, uh, don't like our current constitution. Mm -hmm. Well, that's another story. Yeah, well, well, it is, but you know that's an ongoing issue for sure. Uh, well, uh, your group actually put together the framework for the convention to deal with. Uh, you uh, uh, you had research done by researchers who researched the executive branch and the and the the uh, legislative branch, the judicial branch, and the Bill of Rights, and uh, all those kind of things, and gave them to the, handed them off, if you will, uh, to the legislature to pass on uh, to, uh, to the delegates when they were elected later. Yeah, Dale Harris is a great classic ah. example. Yes. Tell me about Dale. Well, uh, he just was, we could have got along without him. But tell me this. Yes. Max, Max Baucus was not a, uh, he, he was a, uh, attending some of that stuff. What did he do? Do you remember? It was in the ConCon -Con itself. At the time, in the early, before the Constitution, at the time your commission was in existence, he was in Washington, D.C., working for the Securities and Exchange Commission. Correct. But when you uh, remember that, you put it up for a vote, and the people voted in November of 1970 uh, to 65% to have the Constitution. So going into the 71 session was a, uh, a compulsion to, you, you're required to move ahead now. The people have voted for it, and the legislature created a constitutional convention commission that Alex Blewett was the chairman of, and you handed off the, all the research to them. So your group handed all the research to them, and then they continued to advance that research while elections were being held for ConCon -Con delegates. But how does Max Baucus get involved in that time? Max, Max then, once the Constitution was uh, being called, which would have been in late uh, 71, in late 71, uh, so a year later, uh, he decided that maybe that's, I want to move back to Montana and maybe I could go to work and help that convention. And that's how he got involved. 
he, he he's said, folded politics or permanent. Yeah. Well, yeah, first, yeah, first yeah, with the right. first, he got involved with the con con, right, uh, right? And he called. Uh, he called. Uh, he was kind of tying in with the Missoula delegation because he'd moved at, back to Missoula from D.C. And then he called Leo Graybill, the president of the convention, and said, "Do you think I could go to work?" Well, here he was. He'd got his degree from Stanford, and he'd gotten his law degree from Stanford, and he'd been working for in D.C. for the Securities Exchange Commission. Leo said, "Well, that's a good guy. Let's get him up here and get him put him to work." So he gave him a job at the convention, and he was helping out. So that was his first effort in the political arena in Montana. And subsequent to that, he ran for the legislature. Yeah, and it's a, it's his, his old story is very interesting. Yeah. Tell me. Well, he, uh, he was the underdog right from the beginning, and yet he, he kept winning. Yeah. And uh, I remember the first, his first uh, run... He was uh, hiking around Montana, walking. He walked to and Congress, he called it. That's right. No, he did a good job, and then you look how far he went. From of course, the, those, in those days, the Democrats and Republicans got along pretty damn good, in my opinion, the way they did. And uh, compared to where we are today, it really makes me shudder. I bet that's another story. We won't go to... You know, you you keep going on the con con. Well, you know your reference to working together. If you look at that list you had, uh, and you know John Lyons and uh, and uh, Jack McDonald yeah. uh, in, in, and uh, Jim Moore as your fellow senators, you got along with all those people, right? Right, right, absolutely. Uh, that that speaks well of the time, but it, it speaks well of all of you too. Well, well of the time, and it, it's so, in fact, uh, I, one of the things I hope we have a chance to touch upon is the contrast between then and today with the politics of the people we have in office. And, of course, I'm biased, but uh, I, I uh, shudder every morning reading the paper about what, uh, is, is how the current legislature or administration is just ignoring, in my opinion, the Constitution and good government. But that's another story. Well, that actually isn't another story. That is part of the story, actually. Uh, it's an important part of our history that uh, to recognize and acknowledge the differences between the times but also with the, with the people. Uh, so you were able to work with all those folks and then not that there weren't spirited battles, right? There were spirited battles between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, well, the big battle was the sales tax at right, that time. Right, right. In fact, I ended up not uh, broadcasting it, but I ended up thinking that the proper, well, a proper sales tax was a good idea. But, but I didn't go very far with it because uh, Mahoney, I think, was... Uh, our boss at the Senate at the time, and he took care of <laughs> Well, in the 67, yeah, in the 67 session, the sales tax came up, and the House was controlled by the Republicans, and Jim Felt was the Speaker right, of the right. House. And they right. passed the sales tax and sent it over to you guys. Right. And you, the Democrats had a majority in the Senate, and Gene Mahoney was the majority leader. That's right. And... Uh, and he said, this is not going to pass, I think. <laughs> so you deep-sixed it, though. And that put it to bed for four, for four years, actually. Well, and uh, Dorothy, when she ran for governor, she said that she could live with a sales tax. And uh, she lost by the skin of her teeth. And uh, everybody says that uh, that's the reason that she lost. She uh, she believed in a sales tax, but she uh, uh, couldn't couldn't convince enough people. Well, you know, and of course, uh, you know, the people were opposed to a sales tax when it was put up to the vote right. in right. 1971. 70 percent of the people voted against it, 
And, right. And uh, so. The Democrats took control of everything then. Yeah, and uh, and and the, and right in that right at that time, right after that election, they that that very same election, they elected delegates to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, so that kind of influenced the the tenor of the convention uh, because of that. Uh, you can't say too much about it, but, but there is at least some involvement of the sales tax attitude that affected the number of Democrats versus the number of Republicans at the convention. Well, and the Republicans were there. Were, there was a lot of uh, progressive uh, Everybody, uh -huh. not everybody, almost everybody in the convention, in my opinion, had some degree of uh, being uh, progressive. Well, they were citizens looking for change. I guess that inherently makes you kind of progressive. Uh, right. Uh, there was a reasonable number of legislative Republicans who were, we would say, progressive. Uh, compared to today. Right, right, right. Uh, you could almost recognize uh, when you looked at the CONCON delegates and the legislators that they could find there could be common ground found fairly well between the parties, except for some key issues. Sales tax was a key issue, but when you were working on uh, a lot of changes in natural resource law or in uh, environmental law, uh, it seems to me that you had a pretty strong majority in favor of those things. Absolutely. It, it was a golden age for it. <laughs> Civil rights and all the rest of women's rights. Uh, it was a wonderful time period to be in politics, in uh -huh. my opinion. The, uh, uh, what was his name that created, well, for example, the Montana Environmental Policy Act, MEPA, that allows... Right. Uh, uh, what was his name from the House side? George, uh, uh, mm. uh, 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 I'm drawing a blank oh. now on his last name. Uh, uh, but uh, a number of those uh, 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 strong environmental laws were sponsored by Republicans. Uh, Harrison Fagg sponsored some of them. Uh, That's right. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of progressivity going on everywhere at that Darryl, time. I think it's where you're George about. Darrow, absolutely, George Darrow. Right. Yeah, he Montana Environmental Policy Act was his. Yes, and uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, uh, those were interesting times, and and you guys seem to work together. Uh, uh, it speaks uh, it speaks well for the times. And again, that was reflected when they decided at the CONCON to not divide by party. They sat alphabetically. Right. That was different than you. In the legislature, you sat by party. Yes. Uh, do you feel like it might have developed more camaraderie and partnership by having it the other way? Oh, well, sure. Common sense. But the, the party system is here to stay. Uh, whether we like it or not, mm -hmm. but if we uh, could get that catch that problem solved, yeah, and plus a, a couple other things, I think uh, we'd get a lot of things cleared up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, the, so uh, if you had your druthers now, would you recommend that? Uh, the legislature currently split down the middle with the seating Democrats on one side, Republicans on the other mostly. Uh, would you, uh, given your experience at the time and what you've seen since then, what would be your attitude toward whether or not that was something that ought to go on in Montana uh, now? You mean to set, set off of, uh, yeah. alphabetically? Yes, yes. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. You think that would help serve the interests of the state? Yeah. And the other one, what is it? Uh, Y'all got it here. You go uh, with memory, but uh, where you run for elections, the uh, top vote getters uh, rise to the top. Right. 
What, what is that called? Uh, oh, uh, well, uh, there's a lot of talk right now about this kind of ranked, ranked voting. So that that's uh, what I'm so about. that yeah. that they that's just had that yeah they just had that in Alaska re in the last week or so, right? Uh, uh, from which emerged a female indigenous Democrat as the House member from Alaska. Yeah. So it's so you get strange things, but you vote for your number two, one, two, three, and four. They put they had in that case they had uh, four people on the ballot. And you voted rank, rank voted one, two, three, and four, and then they calculate them out from there. Regardless of party, they belong to. Okay? That's right. That's right. The top two are the top two. Whether the top two might have been Republicans, and they might have been Democrats, one of each. It's it's certainly an in interesting idea. But, but uh, well, that's also long before uh, Trump came along, and he's. Uh, we won't even get started on that subject. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> well, you and I could go for a long ways on that, but yeah, that <laughs> uh, it may not be proper for public consumption. <laughs> <laughs> well, quite frankly, I feel sorry for my uh, good old-time Republican friends. They are today, they've got a hell of a problem on their hands, in my opinion. Well, you know, I sure talked to a lot of uh, folks who were around years ago who say, boy, I wish, I, I, I don't like it the way it is now. I'd rather have more working together. And yeah. they, they don't really know the system we have today. That's true. And, uh, Absolutely true. And the, 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 our new constitution came along just exactly at the right time. Mm -hmm. Dude. Uh, forward movement in the whole government of uh, governing of uh, Montana at that time. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so so much for my opinion. That count. Well, uh, we're here to we are here to hear your opinion too. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm uh, kind of biased. <laughs> well, uh, we all are, but you have an informed bias. Yeah, that reason for it. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, do you remember uh, observing? Did you observe any of the Constitutional Convention? Did you go up there to see any of it? Oh, a little of it. Yes, I did. But, but I, uh, I obviously had no no official uh, part of it. Right. Other than when I was a legislature. It, to recommend that they have the convention, but you went. But when they convened in in January of 2021, 2022, uh, uh, you dropped. It was not a legislative year, so you. Uh, but you dropped down to Helena to watch a few sessions. Yeah, uh, uh, Riker took care of making sure that I did uh, said it as best as I could. <laughs> Arlene? Arlene Reichert. She had you on the straight and narrow? Uh, she, she's a real jewel in my book, but she she kept me pretty well briefed on what's, what's going on in Helena. And I suppose uh, that applied to, to, to most everybody. Uh, do you remember the... Uh, after they passed it, are you? Uh, do you have recollections about uh, when they were promoting it for passage? It had to go to the voters, right? Right. And of course, it uh, went to the Supreme Court, one by one vote, mm -hmm. and uh, then uh, the one of the most uh, uh, one unpopular part of it was uh, unicameral. Right. And uh, we went to the vote of the people and they said no. Uh, they, 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 they had, because they, people could vote no on some things, some things and still pass a constitution was one of those secret weapons that uh, allowed us to pass. I think that's fair to say that they took the con three controversial things and put them on separate vote. 
Right. One was unicameral. For people were, uh, who aren't familiar with the term, uh, unicameral. Uh, uh, th that means one legislative body, not two, right? Correct. Uh, so you wouldn't have a House and the Senate. You'd have a House or, or a Senate, but it was, that was it. There wasn't another one. Wasn't in Nebraska, 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 the, uh, yeah. That you had that, yeah. And it didn't go anywhere. And I can understand why, but that's another issue. Now you did go up and, uh, having observed the process, when they all one hundred signed it, uh, were you surprised that all one hundred signed the Constitution? Yes, I I was surprised very pleased, but uh, there were enough uh, issues that people could vote no on and still vote yes on the final document. That was a real uh, good idea. A strategic move on the part of the CONCON delegates. Yes, they yes. put a uh, unicameral legislature on the outside to be voted on, and they voted yep. it down. Uh, but voted the Constitution in, uh, right. and then they 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 did the same thing with uh, uh, the death penalty. I think you're right there. Well, I know you're right. What are the, what are the states have a have a record like that? Uh, well, it's quite a thing to say that they would put it up and said to let the people decide. Uh, but if you put it in the Constitution itself, it might have killed the Constitution. So it became an outside issue. Uh, let's, and uh, uh, it's a unicameral legislature. Uh, the third outside issue was gambling. The th yes, yes. third outside issue was gambling. That's right. So w were you a gambling advocate? Not really, not really. Uh, in fact, uh, Jerry Jennings is sitting next to, to me here, uh -huh. reminded me that that was one of the issues sure, issues sure. he came up. And were were you generally against gambling or for it? I kind of neutral on it. I, I mean, if if I had to come come down to a move, I'd probably be against it. Mm -hmm. Uh, they they uh, uh, suggest that you know everybody's got an opinion on this and everybody can vote. But if you voted, uh, it's easier to say no to something on the ballot than it is to say yes. So right. if, if you put it, if you put something like that in the body, it meant it was likely going to get a no, uh, one of those. But but but. The death penalty was not passed. The unicameral was not passed, but gambling was allowed. So the people voted yep. for gambling. Uh, so I, I guess that tells the tale about that one. Yes. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and, and, Makes you wonder, man is capable of governing himself. Mm -hmm. Going in a lot of these issues. Yeah, uh, it was. Uh, so those three things, now they were voted on separately, but uh, do you recall the level of campaigning that was done to pass the Constitution? It had to go before the voters in the summer, in June uh, of 1972. And so they were going to take it out there to the voters and have some people talk about it and give speeches and whatnot. Do you recall any of that aspect of it? I do. I do recall it. And uh, I was very pleased when it ended up passing. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was controversial. There was there was some uh, negatives out there. To put it mildly. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, and uh, it passed by. Do you remember how much? Two, two, two. No, I don't. Very narrow. That's what I was going to, I was going to say that, all, but, that, but, uh, but you're right. Maybe, maybe 2,500 votes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And right. So they it passed narrowly, 
And uh, again, that's uh, when I went to the Supreme Court. And they had, uh, who was that? Uh, uh, one of them to vote against in the Supreme Court. Uh, but didn't? He voted against it. He, the court turned it down. The two that the two that voted against the Constitution uh, were uh, James T. Harrison Sr., the Chief Justice, right, and Wesley Castles, the Associate Castles. Justice. That's what I was thinking about. And the yeah. three that voted in favor of the Constitution were Gene Daly, who came from Great Falls. Uh, and Frank Haswell, who would come yeah. from the Flathead, and uh, John C. Harrison, not related to the other Harrison. That's what gave the three votes that passed it. Thank you. You have a good memory. <laughs> uh, and it was a three to two vote. Yeah. By one one of those people swing the other way, we wouldn't have a new constitution. Yeah, absolutely. Shows you how close it can get. Yep. Uh, and uh, uh, then they embarked on a, they, they'd saved up about $10,000 to carry on a campaign. And they, they, someone went to court, I think it was the Farm Bureau, and said they can't spend that money. And the court agreed with them. So the, suddenly they didn't have any money, and they carried on a little campaign, a low-cost campaign, all over the state, talking to people, individuals, and groups. Do you remember that campaigning? It was pretty low-key. No, I do not. Yeah. Uh, how about the result when it happened? Did you see well, a lot of celebrating? Was very close. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, was there celebrating? Yeah, some some celebrating in, in, in democratic areas. Yeah, uh, which at the time Great Falls was one. That's right. This last election, if you <laughs> go back to the after a month or so, Cascade County did not send one Democrat to Helena. Mm -hmm. I saw that. I saw that. I thought that was rather intriguing. For what was a kind of a union town. Yep. So uh, uh, once, so seventy one though was your last session in the Senate. Right. And that was the end of sixty seven was the two year term, then sixty nine, seventy one together, which took you through right. seventy two. Uh, did you run again at that point, or decide that was no, it? I no, I uh, got convinced that I should go, go home and and uh, melt the cows, so to speak. I, I was a dairy farmer, and uh, uh, the milk business at that time was getting pretty competitive. And I, anyway, I decided I wouldn't go and uh, stay in politics, and and, uh, and I went home. Uh, and I've been sorry ever since. Well, did you take, uh, you know, I think a little public service was kind of in your blood. Did you, uh, what what got you to uh, think about becoming a county commissioner? Well, it, it just uh, was a time to do it. And, and uh, uh, I was getting tired of being a dairy farmer. <laughs> and I... <laughs> That's a tr true answer. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, well, your dairy farm was doing okay. You didn't need the money. You just needed a, a better a better job. Right, right. Today, that's true. Today, uh, the milk farmers doing pretty good, but in Montana, it's primarily the Hutterites. Yeah, they're doing a very good job of producing milk. Uh, let's see that. Uh, Ted Schwinden told me one time, he said, everyone who's working on the farm needs to have a city job to get by. Absolutely. And so you decided to go run for something else, didn't you? Well, I also uh, kept my military uh, 
uh, years up. And so I got 20 good years military in the Air Force and the Air Guard. And uh, that was one of the wiser decisions I made. Mm -hmm. That helped you with the pen. Have a second income if you're going to be a farmer. Yeah, and so you, but you did have the the income at the with the National Guard or the Reserve, right? Uh, and then you, uh, uh, but how long was it before you ran for county commission? Oh God, I ran for it in eighty uh, nine, I think it is. Okay, and how long did you serve? Four, uh, six years. Was that a one six year term? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, okay. That's the way they did it back then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, how did you find that? Well, it was interesting, but we uh, were constantly in uh, in question because uh, of uh, oh the uh, issue on. Uh, uh, Voting. It had to be public. Right. I think it's a good idea. But in a county form of government, anytime any two commissioners are talking about anything, they're subject to someone accusing them of uh, being illegal. Right. Well, it, I didn't get involved with that, but I did. It made that form of government very uh, unpopular. You had to go to the bathroom by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I said earlier, I sometimes wonder if man is capable of governing himself. Yeah, well, you can wonder that. And hey, every everything, every question has an answer, but uh, it's sometimes hard to figure out what it is. Go ahead, Dick. Ask you the question since this, this is being recorded. Yeah. Uh, is Trump going to make it to get uh, even nominated? Uh, hard to tell in my mind. You know, it's pretty early in the process. He's, I'd say he starts with a leg up or maybe an arm up. I'm not sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, he probably starts out ahead. Then the question is can he, can he keep that uh, inside their party? Uh, which have their own procedures. Uh, right. Uh, it's know. an unfair question. I'd be yeah, unfair. yeah. Well, uh, I, I certainly have a lot of opinions about Donald Trump, and some of which <laughs> I would not repeat on the air. But, uh, 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 you know, interestingly, he represents a lot of people. And, That's right. And it's part of the divisions of society right now when we see that see that stuff going on. Uh, That's right. So uh, uh, how long were you counting the county commission, you said? Just, Six years. You just went one, one, one term. Uh, a, lot of people was, get, a lot of people get in there and like to stay. Well, what possessed you to not? Well, I, would, I had it with uh, politics at that time. Uh -huh. and I, got, got, uh, got, I just thought it was time to get out and, and, and clear, clear the air. Uh huh. And, you went back to the farm. Yeah. Uh, now, what was the name of your farm? Were you the, sure you're the Ayrshire farm, weren't you? Right. Right. Is that that? So it was named after your brand, your kind of cattle. Right, right. Uh, well, my my dad uh, passed on at that time period, and you know, I had a, a tough choice to make. Yeah. That's that's life. Well, that's what brought Ted Schwinden back into Montana. Same type of thing. Uh, he was going for his Ph.D. at the University of Minnesota in history. And he got called back to Tule Creek to run the farm. Yeah, you know. That's right. Uh, it uh, it all it all uh, it all takes its toll on on all that stuff. Uh, your uh, uh, 
your sense of, uh, of uh, how much progress has been made uh, in Montana in the last 50 years, uh, assuming maybe we've been sliding back a little bit the last couple of years, but when you look at the changes that took place as a result of the Constitution, uh, 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 what, what, what's your assessment? Well, everybody was just two steps forward, and then once in a while, one step back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or just the opposite, maybe I should say, but it's just, it's, uh, it's, it's a good question. Montana is so much better off with our Constitution than we were with the old one mm -hmm. that it's not even a fair question. Uh, but I don't, I don't know if everybody realizes it. Well, today's politics. There's a lot of noise in today's politics about the Constitution. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if those who are in opposition to it represent the majority of the thinking of their political parties. Uh, I've seen some uh, polling results that suggest a high percentage of support for the Constitution in both political parties. I, I hadn't seen that, but I believe it. When I talk to people on the streets, I find, I find it hard to find much opposition to the Constitution. It seems people are for it. Well, I, that may be true, and I'm not arguing with you, but uh, the uh, uh, current legislature seems to ignore that and with the, the, the judicial system problems they've got and uh, some of the other issues that I've, I've, I'm so prejudiced on. It might be, uh, you know, worth looking at it and, you know, saying that the people that are in strong opposition in the legislature might be in a bubble and might not reflect the thinking of most of the voters in their political party. Uh, I've seen some polling data that shows that it's almost equal the strong support for this constitution in Montana so that uh, perhaps the Republican leadership in the House right now, or in the Senate and the House right now, that leadership may be misreading the, their body politic, the people who, rep who they represent. Uh, well, I prefer to believe that, but uh, <laughs> good luck. <sir. laughs> well, you know, it's, it, it, it happens. It'll, it'll happen quite a bit. Uh, you know, things will come to a vote at some point. There'll be a, a lot of uh, attacks on democracy. Uh, uh, we're, uh, uh, as you see it from a local government perspective, we're holding up, a local government state perspective, we're holding up pretty well? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty well. Uh, it, it depends. Uh, this last year, absolutely not. It, yet, it, 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 a big uh, red wave that uh, was forecast never you know, got produced. So it's a, it's a mixed bag. What's your opinion? Well, the ups and downs, you know. It's a, uh, someone said to me, the worst thing you could do, look at the, the bill drafting request list because everything terrible is on that list when it starts. They just don't all get turned into bills. And if it gets yeah. turned into bills, they don't all get uh, passed, that there is some common sense. Uh, uh, a, uh, Harry, uh, I was introducing a reporter to Governor Schweitzer one time, and he wanted to say, I'm new in town, I want to meet Governor Schweitzer. And so I fixed up a meeting, and the person, the reporter who was from Indiana said, well, what is Montana? Are they, is, is it a red pa state? Is it a purple state? Is it a blue state? What, what color is the Montana voting population? And Governor Schweitzer uh, said, uh, well, I don't know about colors, but I can tell you this about Montanans. 
It doesn't matter if they're Democrat or Republican or Independent or what they are. Uh, almost all Montanans have a little bit of libertarianism in them. They like to make their own mind up. And they kind of want to be let alone. And uh, uh, I think that's kind of true. We all have uh, strong independent views in Montana. Well, I think I'm not going to argue with you there. I'm not <laughs> going to argue with you. In fact, I'm going to be, remain concerned uh, what's going to happen at the next election, considering what we saw in Montana this uh, couple of years, a couple mm -hmm. of months ago. Well, of course, the next cycle is going to be all the statewide elected officials, so it'll be of more import than the one that just had, we just had. Uh, right. You know, uh, but uh, the uh, we talked to uh, young people who were associated with the Constitutional Convention, and they say it uh, represented a. Uh, a special circumstance in their life that they were able to work on something that meaningfully. Have you thought about your role in those terms at all? Oh, I, I don't know. We tend to think we're lucky if there are the people that were out there before us doing this. Yes. And you're going to have to live with the fact that we think we were lucky we had you involved. That's, that's, it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> but, uh, I've always enjoyed politics, and I always will, because, uh, oh, it, it's so important to, to our life. I mean, look, look at the world situation and uh, some of the nuts that are out there. And uh, we, we, we've got to stay involved. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like it seems like that that the uh, we need to educate our citizens. Uh, do you have a, a sense of that issue of citizen knowledge and citizen uh, involvement? And do citizens know enough anymore, or do they need more civics education? Uh, how do you think in this new world of social media or whatever they call it, uh, are people as informed and willing to participate as they used to be? Boy, that's a good question. I looked at the world my grandfather was in and uh, what we have today. You, you asked your question there, David. I, I, I don't know. Well, it, it, is, it is intriguing, that's for sure. Uh, yeah. You know, we're we're getting uh, we're getting getting the near the end of our hour together, and uh, <laughs> as as time time seems to fly, uh, uh, I I I wish I, I would we would would have been able to be up there with you, but we're trying this new technology uh, to see if the Zoom mechanism will work, and and we'll uh, uh, be able to do these things remotely like this. It, I think it helps a lot, but we're what we've been doing is celebrating the Constitution, Harry, and your role in it. And I know you're thinking, well, what did I do? But you were there, you were in the room where it happened, you helped make the decisions that advanced ideas to the Constitution, that helped formulate what's the basic governmental structure of Montana this very day. Well, that's true, and I uh, was wondering when. Uh, we first started talking about you interviewing me. What in the world could I add to the to the program? And I'm still wondering if I'm adding well, anything. Let me assure you, and I'm, and the time is running out. Let me assure you, we've enjoyed every word you've offered on this, and we appreciate your participation here, and we appreciate your participation with the Constitution. Thank you, Harry. Well, thank you very much, Evan. I appreciate it. And to all of our viewers, uh, we look forward to seeing you the next time.